Um, good afternoon, I'm Jan Hiche, and this is a recording of the second lecture in CPD 710. This is part of our inquiries into advanced construction methods, and this is really a discussion, a reappraisal really, of um, existing construction knowledge that I assume you, you would have in place. So in many ways, this is a really it's 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 seen as a, a a primer the lecture, and I assume that a lot of what I will be um, mentioning or discussing, you would have actually already um, covered in your um, undergraduate degree. So so you might already know it. It's really more important that um, that you become aware of the aspects that are. Um, that you might need to improve your, or, or brush up your knowledge on a little bit and um, really prompts for, for further inquiry. It's, it's not, um, we won't be discussing advanced systems in this lecture. We will really just be discussing the basics that would be known. And it's not going to be um, in detail altogether. I, I think there is, um, you can't do it in one lecture. It's a very complex field and, it, and you, need, you need many years for that. So it's really just um, prompts into aspects that you need to be aware of and you might want to go and um, you know learn more about. This is going to be a series of four videos. We'll um, start with the first one, it will be the introduction and um, we'll discuss two materials. The second one will discuss two additional materials being masonry and stone. The, fine, the third video talks about assembly and um, fixing methods, um, some basics around that, um, really focusing on columns um, and, and how that meets the, the ground. And then the final video is just concluding the lecture and talking about how we our suggestions on working in with with construction um, methods or or technologies that you are unaware of or un, that's unknown to you, so that you want that, that one will have to. Um, explore and um, really develop as you are working. It's um, just for for those that um, haven't been part of last week's lecture, just a reminder that we spoke about AB, IBTs and ABTs. It was really an inquiry into alternative building technologies, how that relates to the um, SAN standards and um, the fact that we have uh, a third party or alternative body called Agrima that can certify non-standard materials being innovative building technologies and um, that you can use that as a means to ultimately um, comply to the national building regulations and that would be um, used as an alternative to what is promulgated in the South African National Building Standards. Um, so. If, if you're still a little bit uncertain about what it means and how it relates, do go back to that lecture and um, and, and, and look at that again. Um, I think a good place to start at any point, really, is to reflect a bit on your own knowledge. And um, we won't be discussing this in detail. This is more for a discussion in, in, in the lecture session. But I think it's important to every now and then to go back and see where you're at in this in a sense. So go and look at what sources you've got. What did you cover in your undergraduate years? Um, what where are your handbooks, your notes, and so forth? Go and get them all together and start developing a system th through which you can actually explore and um, learn from, so that you can. Um, because the one thing about construction, as any other. Um, content, um, but I think more specifically related to technology and materials in 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 the built environment and, and design is there's no way that you're going to remember everything. You have to start developing methods of understanding what are critical, what are those experiential knowledge that you have to know that you are building up, and then what are those other sources that you often use, and what are those that you would refer to. Um, at times when it's not used, at, if it's not as critical, and to know what the what the, that system is you're working within. Obviously, it doesn't help um, going online and googling all all you know any construction 
question you've got because there's often incorrect or knowledge that's shared that's specific to a specific context. So, so sometimes it might be um, based in the UK or in the US, so that, that can't work. So you've got to have some basic knowledge that you, you've got to use and apply. But certainly there's other aspects so like specific materials and so forth or specific technological systems that you can go and um, um, search online and get their brochures and use it as a means to understand what you're dealing with at that moment. So it's important to understand, therefore, this framework within which you work. So what do you know? What's the previous knowledge you can build on? And then how do you take this further? Then there's a, 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 some questions that I just want you to think about as prompts to you. So first of all, think about the resources you've got. And remember, they, these include books and online sources and brochures and so forth, but also people. Who are those individuals that you can speak to, that you can use, and that would be willing to be, as, be mentors? Who can you... In offices, often we use a method of... Um, checking drawings before we actually issue them. Those individuals that check it are often the people with more experience. They might be technologists. Um, so if you want to create those relationships with, that, with those individuals. I mean, there's many in the build, in construction specifically, there's many individuals who are absolutely willing to share, but really, um, um, but they're not going to write it up in books and so forth. So maybe it's about creating make creating those relationships with someone that can you can take your drawings to and discuss it with them. That could be a method that you can use now as a student, but you can take it further because that's really about developing methods of working in practice one way. So that's one thing to think about. Um, then become aware of CPD courses. Um, other resources um, in future you'll be using CPD courses working with individuals um, salespersons from different companies or um, representatives who often have a lot of technical knowledge of their specific products use that as well as use it as a framework or network within which you can actually develop your own knowledge and then um, think about the uh, think about your experience in practice what choices were made and how were those choices made? You would often find that architects consider risk very carefully in their design decisions and therefore chose to use specific materials and systems. If you can, ask them about it, discuss it with them and help that to, to start defining your own thinking around how one choose new or different technologies and how do you use the existing knowledge and technologies that you that you, that, that, you, that you know works in a certain way or that provides a certain um, guarantee for you in, 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 the, in, in that project. In this lecture, we will, like I said, it's really just a recap. So we'll talk about um, these five materials, steel, concrete, timber, masonry, and stone. Um, we will really just talk briefly about some ideas around it, some prompts, things to be aware of. The aim is not to give you all the knowledge in this lecture. Please use it as a way to then go and look for the answers. Um, there's two very good um, handbooks I think you can use. The one is Architective. Um, that was developed by a number of colleagues at TUT. It's, I think, possibly the most recent collation of basic construction principles. Um, the second being the construction primer. South Africa. It was developed by Hans Biechlin. It's available as well at Bokende, but also um, if you can contact him or contact Caroline if you're interested. And then there's another book called the Construction Specifications um, Standards. Um, Construction Specifications and Standards for South Africa. It's um, a book developed by Hans Biechlin that really helps you to identify this, the range of standards that, that relates to certain materials or construction systems. And that's really helpful because if you start specify, specifying materials, you need to know what to refer to. What are, what are already stated, um, it will help you ensure good quality of the installation. So it's called the Constructions and Specification Standards. And I see I've got one that's 6.3. Um, there's a number of them available at the, the reading room at, at Bokende as well. 
we will talk briefly about fixing methods. A lot of it will already been covered in the material specifics discussion, so I won't repeat that. And then we'll talk about um, an approach or framework to, to, to undertaking projects that you that that might be forays into new or alternative technologies. Um, good. So the first material that we'll start with is um, steel structures. And I think <clears throat> we are, um, I think steel is really, um, really an exciting material that's often used in, in a number of ways. We, in many of the projects we know of would often use it as um, smaller entities or components that's inserted or installed within buildings. So it can often be the staircases, the handrails, um, the roof structures could use it, pergola structures and so forth. So, so it can often make part of a larger structure or design that that uses a totally different material. But it could also be a complete structural system that's used for a design. And um, so we get steel buildings. Um, we don't often get them because they're quite expensive, but um, they're really exciting to work with. And that they require quite a few basic things to understand. First of all, you are working with a framed system. And that's a that's a, 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 a um, not a mental shift, but a conceptual understanding to have when you are working with the technologies and constructions. When it's a framed system, you are working with the basics being columns and beams. Obviously, then framed systems work on different scales. So you'll have a, a macro or, 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 or the macro structure of the building, which could be the main columns and um, beam structures that could also be other materials if need be. And then within that, you've got the infill that starts working with struts and um, noggins and um, floor plates and roof plates and so forth. So a secondary system. And then in there, you could actually have another tertiary system in it. So it's about understanding how these columns, the basic of columns and beams actually gets changed into the diff or, 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 or changes in terms of scale as it fits into the, the, the structure itself. That means that once you start working with framed systems, you also work with infill. And remember, in steel structures, we don't often have buildings that's completely covered in steel. We might have a corrugated roof or corrugated walls, but there's other materials used in there. Um, insulated material, insulation, possibly often lightweight um, materials such as gypsum boards and fiber cement boards and so forth. And they move a bit differently in terms of weight, um, thermal movement and moisture um, than steel. So you've got to always allow for that. But that's the first thing. Understand that you've got infill that you'll be using. In that. Then um, do be aware that obviously steel is a very in energy intensive material. So it's when you start using steel, it's really all about efficiency and having to, 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 to improve that and ensuring that you're, you're optimizing the, 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 the material use in the process. Um, the nice thing about steel is that it has a very high tensile um, strength and um, very high weight to strength ratio. And so you can typically use a 1 in 20 um, ratio. You can have a look. There's a book called The Metric Handbook that has a whole section on construction systems and their typical weight to uh, depth to, 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 to um, span ratios. Really nice way to just guide you as a non-engineer to, to have an understanding of what the sizing are that you're working with. So have a look at that, the metric handbook, and it's got a section called structures. Um, it's got uh, many, many chapters, but in there's a chapter called structures, so that could be helpful. Um, also, and then if you don't, you can always just use a 1 in 20 or 1 in 25, I think should be accurate, in terms of the depth of a beam, what's the length of that, um, just to, as, a, as a guide. Then, um, Note that we've got hot rolled and cold formed steel sections. Now remember the difference between the two. Hot rolled really refers to heavy steel sections. Those are, like you say, hot rolled, and um, they are often used as structural steel elements um, for the main structure. And then cold formed are steel sections that are formed from plate steel. Um, so that's after the, the, the initial um, profile's been made that it's formed into a range of different components that are used 
within the building in, in multiple ways. Um, remember that the, the cold form can also be used within the building, so it could be for roof beams and so forth, if it's the depth's correct. Um, and then it's also often used for LSF structures, light steel frame structures, that um, you, you can have a look at um, in, in, in your um, uh, on your own, it's 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 it. Light steel frame structures are made out of thin, um, really light galvanized steel profiles. It's 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 often um, the, the the profiles are often formed um, or cut on site specifically for that design. So we it, it's a, it's quite an optimized system. It's often um, it can, for that matter, be designed by an algorithm. Um, so it's often really computerize the whole process but it, if you think about a timber frame structure those two have really close relation there it, it's, it's it's a series of it's a, it's a dense frame of um, galvanized steel sections that are then um, fixed together often often screw fixed or riveted together and they are often then used with light steel light uniform material so fiber cement boards insulation with vapor barriers and remember to use vapor barriers and, um, and, and, and fixed in it. So hot roll is a bit different. Hot roll can actually be integrated um, with um, the more multi-story buildings, really, um, and that could be many. I mean, that, uh, um, uh, the World Trade Center, for that matter, uh, was, a, was, a, was a steel structure as well. Um, so you can go for really tall buildings, and that's often then integrated uh, um, with, with concrete slabs and so forth as well so it's so just as a understanding of the two different ways of using it remember that steel needs to be finished in a certain way and it often rusts so um you can't just get away with not finishing it um unless you're something at core 10 but remember core 10 steel is not really available in south africa and they do stain when um used for over, over periods because the water that drips off it is does have some residue in it, so it's, there's those implications. Um, but the thing is to think about that the manufacturing and assembly process relates closely to the finishing of the steel. We often pr promote steel that the steel is galvanized, and we've got two methods being hot dip or painted systems. And if you hot dip the galvanization, then you actually, um, that's when you take the whole component and you dip it in a, in a, in a bed that's just very hot, galvanized, uh, you know, liquid that would then, um, that, that would then galvanize the whole section. But when you take it to site, you've got to weld it again on site. You actually damage, you need to take off the galvanized section. So you, you damage the, the preservation that they are. So rather think carefully about how you assemble it. And there's a few options. You can weld it fixed to weld off-site, um, or you can bolt fix it together. There's also the option to rivet it, but that's part of the bolt fixing, so it's mechanical fixing. When you when you use mechanical fixing, then it's then ultimately you need to start designing the components that would come to site. So think about how you fit it on a truck, get it to site, and how you then start bolting the sections together. This will be done with an engine in, in practice. You'll, you'll, you'll meet and discuss it with an engineer. They will advise on the size of the sections, steel sections and the bolts that needs to be used and then that goes to the steel manufacturer who would create the shop drawings in the end and you can use that ultimately to to and you'll have to check it and make sure that it present, that it has the right aesthetic or, or, or structural or con, um, um, design that conveys your intention of the project um, so that's actually quite a good way to do it and a quite exciting way to work but you have to be very accurate there because you have to ultimately even, I mean, in that process, you even design the, the slot, the, the slotted hole where it fits in. One thing to always think about and chat to the engineer is how do you ensure um, that there is some tolerance in the system so you can fix it in the end. Because remember, you have to fix this onto something. So um, you have to um, bolt fix it to concrete slab, for instance, or something, and you have to fix it together. So there's got to be some tolerance, although it can be quite accurate as well in the end um, and then should you do any welding on site you've got to fix it again you've got to clean you, you've got to um, ensure that you galvanize it again and then you can paint it as well so remember you can also harder coat steel um, it's a bit expensive and um, there's limitations to that as well it's a good way to finish in the end 
Um, steel sizes, there's, there are existing steel sizes available. It's the, it's the, the Steel Institute actually publishes it online. It used to be called the Red Book. Um, but go on online, get them. There's a whole Excel spreadsheet you can download. And, and whenever you're using steel, you can't use it beyond that. Those profiles are what you have. And often those profiles are even limited to what's available at that point in time. So you might have to change it again. But you can't just choose any, you know, available, invent any size of steel. Those profiles are given, profiles are made, and you use those to make the different components. I think it's quite exciting, though, because it also gives you an opportunity to, to like a little bit like working with a puzzle. You've got to put all those different aspects together in the end. Um, so something you might not have dealt in undergraduate years, I do think, though, that you've covered it, is bimetallic corrosion. Remember, that's when you put two um, types of steel together, um, they, uh, and they differ in their nobility. So that they, the one is as more electrolytes than the other one, which means that the one becomes a, um, a sacrificial material. You can see it in this in this image. So very clearly, the one steel component here is rusting completely, while the others aren't. Right? And, and the problem often is that the where you mix the steel steel types. So it's often when you mix steel and stainless steel, for instance. Then the steel starts um, rusting. Um, the, that's usually the points where you don't want any damage. The same thing happens when you mix um, galvanized pipes and copper pipes. You can move from the water can flow from a galvanized steel pipe to a copper pipe, but it can't flow back into from a copper pipe back into a galvanized steel pipe. You actually damage the you have damage on the copper pipe and the, and the galvanized steel pipe in the end um, at an, a much faster rate. So. Um, an important factor to remember, and so what you'll see is there's a, a number of these tables that exist, and they're, they're, what, what, they're not always as clear in terms of understanding, but for instance, sometimes, I mean, you could see, for instance, here, aluminium will, will, uh, will react to zinc alloys and magnesium, which we don't often use as much, um, although you do for zinc you might so so there's a relation there you want to be careful there but, but it doesn't re, um, react to carbon steel for instance so they work quite well where you can see carbon steel and stainless steel actually reacts um, so be careful there you and, and what the, the, the suggestion then is if you've got these two two types of steel you, you don't first of all don't try and mix it just try and work with the same type of steel or metal. I would rather say metal in this way, in this case, um, um, that so that you don't get it. But if you do, start thinking or look for ways to avoid bimetallic um, corrosion. So the one option is to rather um, look for um, have a uh, insulate the two from each other, and you can you can use paint. Is one way to use it, so you can just simply paint the two components before you fix them. Um, the other option is to use a separator, so like a rubber um, washer, or um, yeah, I mean, often it's a, a like a, a rubber or plastic washer that you use. Or they also propose that when you when you identify what those superficial materials are, that you just over design them a bit so that there's some rusting that can take place. In the end, you can also use an, an, an um, antioxidants to to, to, to to prep it for that. But the best thing is don't mix the two. If you do mix it, don't let them touch in the end, and um, then you you, sh you shouldn't you shouldn't have that problem in the end. Um, okay, so so that's really the basics of of, of, of working with metal and steel structures. Uh, I think do go and have a look at more more detail into it. But um, just remember, those are framed systems. You've got to think about how you get them to site. Off-site manufacturing is best. They are often quite quick and accurate, but you've got to think about the process of getting them. And then because they're energy intensive, use them with care. Don't over-design, uh, you know, use the thickest possible sections you can. See if you can get to slender, beautiful types of structural systems in the end. Um, and then obviously the steel is also effective both in the landscape and 
interiors and for the structure themselves, as long as we um, preserve them and if we, if we seal them using galvanized, if you galvanize them, for instance, or you use stainless steel if you don't want to. Um, or you can use something like a core tin base where you actually want want the, the steel to to degrade over time. But use that with care. Um, great. So the second material to think about and you'll be confronted with quite often is concrete. And concrete is it's just such a, it's 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 an it's an amazing material in one way. It's so flexible and it's really been used for an, a thousand know, years more than a millennia already and it's, it's some of these structures still exist um, but they are also um, energy intensive so think carefully about how you use them try and optimize the use of steel of concrete because the cement is an energy intensive it's one of the most the materials that affect um, as the biggest environmental impact in the world but i think one has to understand it within the context that it's also the material that's used most often without in the world so it's one of those um it's, it's, it's a widely used material it's it can be used in two ways it can be a, a framed structure and that's how we often see it so when we start doing using multi-story buildings that you won't cast the whole building out of concrete that's quite ex expensive but you'll but you'll, you'll align that with masonry infill and so you have floor slabs beams and columns and you Basically, design this frame, and within this frame, you can you can use it, and 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 go and have a look at the different profiles that you can use and the depths that you can design for it. That's actually quite nice about concrete, is you can easily define various depths that are needed within it. Within it. Um, but concrete can simply be also be used as monolithic structures. In the end, you can really cast complete bunkers if you want to, of it. Or um, there's some really interesting work done. Um, where, 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 it's, where um, shattering is, or, or the formwork is placed, and it's it is placed put in place, and the, the concrete is cast all over. It becomes a whole monolithic structure in the process. So, really interesting work that you can do. Remember that concrete can be precast, therefore come to site, and be um, used um, for that. So think about the transportation of it. And precasting is also quite nice because it has a really high quality and accuracy to it, and um, which is exciting. And you can actually the finish of it can be defined really pretty accurately. So precast is really good. The only trick is these are often quite heavy entities and elements, and therefore one has to use it. Um, you better think about how you do it. I know that um, the engineering four building, for instance, precast whole walls. And then those walls, I've been there, it's four meters high and it's what, 12 meters in length, thick mass of concrete walls that have been precast and then it's actually precast on site and then filtered on site. So that, that can really be part of the process. Um, in, we, we will talk a little bit more about that later, but I think it is important to think about the assembly of precast entities. Remember that. We, we often, if we use it with reinforced concrete, you've got to think about ways that you that you fix the precast entity. So either it's put into place, um, so you can look at precast panels, for instance, that's brought to site, positioned in place, and then um, you have a, uh, like, um, a little bit of screed over that, like a ribbon block system. You can go and have a look at that. Um, it's often used. So those are precast entities. It's like lintels and, 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 and floor um, um, it's like beams, but it's floor plates we put in place, and then we cast a thin um, concrete um, slab on top of that, and it now becomes a single entity. Um, so, so it's so you often as a way to to to, to um, merge the two, a precast system with other precast systems, or a precast entity with in situ cast entities. You often bind the reinforcing in the process. So both of them would have a bit of reinforcing and um, protruding beyond the, the entity or the component and then you will actually put the, put it down, you'll bind them down and make sure that the, 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 the steel reinforcing is therefore bound together and then you'll cast that little bit together like a, like a little bit of form work effectively and that's then set in place and that allows for the, 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 the forces to be translated from 
the one entity being a precast entity to a, another entity, whatever that is. But you can also get precast entities that could be lighter, that can simply be, the precast entity could have a steel plate that's protruding, and you can simply weld and bolt fix that to another component. So there's ways of exploring that, or you can simply have it and bolt it into place. Um, so there could be a hole or a lug that's available that's already cast into the, into the precast entity that you can simply bolt fix, or mechanically fix it. Right? So exciting ways of work using it. In situ cast, we obviously do on site, you know that. And if then you just have to, the one thing that's really exciting is you have to work with the formwork. The formwork is um, is is really, well, I suppose the formwork or what we can sometimes say, the false work that you're designing, that which will be removed, um, is quite exciting because there you can change the, the color, the appearance of the concrete, and you have to think about the process of making. How do you actually build the form? And then how do you get the steel into that? And how do you then cast it? Remember that sometimes when you've got a hollow form, you want to actually cast it the wrong way around. Um, so some form works, you can't pressure concrete into place effectively. You have to let it, use, you've got to use gravity to keep it in place. So you build a formwork, and then on top of that, you, you, you pour the concrete. Remember, formwork can be steel, it can also be a rubber product, um, if you want specific finishes, and then you often use timber as well, or, or plywood. If you use timber and plywood, it, um, or timber, it has to be prepared beforehand, um, so um, treated beforehand, so otherwise it'll just absorb all the moisture possibly in there, and that, that, that you don't actually want, um, it will affect the hydration process. Um, and then all formwork actually needs to be prepped with, um, you, you have to have a release agent available as well, so that you can actually remove it in the end, and that you don't damage the concrete in the process as you remove it. Um, remember that it cures for a long time, so it's about 28 days to get it to cure, so, so think carefully of, of that. Um, yeah, I think... Um, Formwork is something, I mean, you can go on for ages about formwork in the end. So it's just some basics to be aware of this. A number of companies that specialize in their formwork, so you're welcome to also look at them. Uh, um, the, the, so, so, uh, and then that, and they start specifying specific types of formwork that they prepare beforehand. So, so just um, you, you can therefore design it yourself, or you can get a company that's, that specializes in that to help you. Remember that you always have to provide tie bars or think about the tie bars in the end when you start casting walls and um, those then affect the, the final finish of the product in the end. Um, one more thing that we can discuss before we continue is that you will be confronted with a number of terms, extenders, that's how we actually make concrete more sustainable or cement more sustainable. So it's Really waste materials that we add to um, to uh, uh, cement products, and then add mixtures. Those are um, products that you add to change the properties of the concrete. So to 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 either either make it more more valuable or workable when you work with it. So we can add plasticizers, super plasticizers. It allows you to use a bit of, a little bit of less water, but actually makes it more workable. So we can get it into all the different little nooks and crannies that we've got the concrete in. But you can also get something called air retarders or air retainers, which um, allows for bubbles to form within the concrete, so you can get a lighter weight concrete that's a bit more, in, that's a higher insulative property. And then you can get accelerators, accelerators or retarders. Those either accelerate the setting process, so you can use, so, so we typically use it in shot creek, for instance, where we would want to stabilize a, 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 a face where you might be digging up a basement and you, you, you basically spray on the concrete and it sets very quickly. Um, on the other hand, you want to use retarders when you are um, transporting it for a long time. So you don't want it to set so quickly or you've got a bit of a difficult um, form, form to fit it in or a large floor plate that you want to cast in one go. Then you use retarders to ensure that you can actually get all the concrete in place. But remember, you can't Whenever you've finished your day, when you've cast your concrete, you actually need to, um, what we call, have a day joint. 
And sometimes you don't want the day join to show. So then you want to pass it as one single entity. Yeah, but you'll discuss that with your engine, with the engineer, and um, if you get to cast as much concrete, you'll have a, a, a specialist or the supplier also provide a specialist that can advise on how you can get it done effectively in the end. You do have joints that you have to think about. Um, so movement joints through the whole building, and when you cast floors, you have um, smaller movement joints every three meters, three by three meters, for instance. So if it cracks, it cracks along that joint. Um, so you don't get a crack right through the whole floor. Mm -hmm. Aspects like that. So um, yeah, just um, think about think about that. Then um, sometimes we 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 really struggle with the with with fitting in. Um, the reinforcing in the concrete itself. So when you use typical steel reinforcing, you actually want to um, you, you actually want to have at least 20 mils on both sides of the steel reinforcing. So we talk, I mean, uh, concrete is often much thicker, so it's not really a problem, but you don't want the steel to be exposed because obviously they, that will start rusting and it will damage the concrete. But if you start casting really thin um, specialist products, so um, like you'll see here, for instance, um, countertops, um, seating. There's even um, I know a number of guys that start casting, um, sort of casting um, glass frames with frames of glasses. Um, then you can look at glass fiber reinforced concrete, and that's when we start using um, fiberglass. It's that's little strands effectively, and there's also ways to use organic material that we actually start looking at, looking at, and. Those are then put into the formwork, and you can then get away with much thinner, um, eloquent types of, of, of um, precast entities. So those are often used for um, kitchen counters, um, furniture, and so forth. Really interesting work. The other thing to think about is you can also start specifying the type of aggregate that you put into the concrete. Now remember, aggregate is critical to get the, 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 the tensile strength into the concrete, um, you, you 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 can. Um, but often we when you do just normal concrete that we don't care too much about what it looks like, then you just get normal aggregate, you know, like grey um, stone, and you specify the size of it. But if you want to start designing, or you start designing kitchen counters or very specific type colours of concrete, or you look at Arbitron for instance, where you start brushing off the concrete, so you want to show the aggregate in the end, um, then you might actually want to specify a specific color. Another thing is if you want to start polishing the concrete, for instance, you use a diamond blade cutter and you and you polish the, 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 the top layer in it so you actually cut a little bit away so you can show the, 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 the um, aggregate. That's another, um, so then you might actually want to start specifying that in the end. Another aspect to just think about is the edge detailing of, of concrete. Remember that it's very difficult to do a 90 degree um, 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 casting if it's a building that's you know pretty big. So if you do a very small component such as you, what you see here, a seat, then I'm sure you can you can get um, you, can, you can use enough super plasticizers and really fine aggregate to, to get the concrete to set um, in a very complex shape. But if you are designing a, a building and it's a large balcony, a 90 degree angle is really difficult to cast throughout. And the chance of actually having um, it not, not, not the, the concrete not going to all the corners or it breaking off as you're taking the shuttering off is quite big. And that's, if you're doing off-shutter concrete, then it's a mess. You can't, you can't redo it. If your off-shutter concrete is damaged, it's damaged. There's nothing else you can do about it. Um, so often what we do is you then actually rather use a chamfered edge or a, 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 a rounder corner so that you can actually allow for this uh, um, of a, a less, less of a sharp corner to actually allow for the concrete to settle quite easily in it and when you cast it and actually take it off without damaging it in the end. Remember formwork is difficult to take off if you need you, you need to think about how you remove the, the formwork in the end. So if it's tapered, it often is tapered if you just slip something off. Um, but otherwise you'll just tap, you, you, you'll peel off the, the formwork in the process. So 
um, if, it's, if it's panels and so forth. When they use form, remember that it must be clean as possible, and um, well, it must be cleaned afterwards. It should always be clean before they use it because it's, the chances of impurities sitting in that concrete forever is really probably, you know, big if it's, it's not. And um, some, some, some types of formula can't be used twice. Um, like timber, for instance, if you use rough timber, if you've taken that off, it's actually quite difficult to use that again. You'll just use it once. Um, but something like steel and some of the, 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 the rubber um, form of instance, you can use quite a few times before, before it um, gets damaged or, 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 or is worn out too much, effectively, to be um, useful in the end. Um, okay, so I'll stop this video here and then we'll continue with the second video where we will discuss timber and um, uh, timber structures and um, masonry structures um, and stone structures um, afterwards.